Welcome everyone to another episode of Friday PM. Charlene and I have just finished a worship workshop with a church in the UK and we really wanted to share some of this great teaching with you. We realized that after many years of traveling on the road, perhaps we can speak from experience and allow you to listen to a few things we've learned from Pastor John and some revelations that the Holy Spirit has dropped into our spirits. So enjoy. want this to be a nice informal chat. We, we're not teachers, we're not theologians, but we love the Holy Spirit and we love worship and we love true worship. So we're just going to chat between us like we always do, isn't yeah. it, right? Yeah. And we, we love to chat about Him and we love to pray together a lot. We love to worship together and we've been through a lot together. We've been uh, around the world, we've been through very deep times and tough times, and we've been uh, through very good times as well. And um, so we're we're like real sisters, eh, Rachi? We were chatting yesterday about true worship, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, we realised that in order to come to true worship, we need to know what false worship is. Isn't it? So uh, we're going to first explore what false and fake worship is, and that will kind of path the way to what real worship is. And I thank God in my journey with the Lord, I grew up with Christian parents and um, they were ministers. I was a, I'm a PK, but I needed to run away and find God for myself, and I needed to really know who he is, you know, because these days, isn't it? We, mm. I just thought the other day that we worship many of us in church. We yeah. sing songs like, um, take full control. I love you, Lord. Um, uh, I will give you my all. All my worship. I'll all give my you all worship. my worship. I'll give you all my praise. Yes. Uh, you alone, I long to worship. And we, yeah, we were saying that we sing these songs and, and often we we don't really, we're not really at the place to express them. Yeah. Because yes, we do love the Lord, but what we were even talking about, and we're going to get into this, was Charlene is going to explain, you know, the difference between fake worship and true worship. Um, but we, um, we were talking about, uh, I've just lost my train of thought, but we were just talking about the fact that it's actually God's love for us that is more important because His love for us doesn't change. Uh, we may come go to church on Sunday and we don't feel like worshipping. The worship leaders might be there and they've had a terrible, terrible, terrible week. And they have to get up there and lead people and you don't feel in the place. And But you see, this is the greatness of our God. This is the great thing about our God. His love and is not determined by our love for Him. His love for us is greater and regardless of what we're going through and regardless of our feelings, He is still worthy to be worshipped and He will even give us the unction and anoint us to worship Him even when we don't feel like it. And because in worshipping Him, we obtain a freedom and we obtain a liberty uh, that nothing that the enemy can't touch. The enemy hates it and he never wants us to come into God's presence. And he wants us to feel that we are not worthy. He wants us to feel that our feelings will dictate our worship. But God says, you come to me just as you are. Come to me dry. Come to me weary. Come to me broken. Come to me. And my love is sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you and my love is sufficient for, for you to be able to worship. 
Yes, Rach. I find many times when the pastor comes and says, come, let's tell him, tell him how much you love him, tell, tell him how much you adore him, give him praise, give him honor. It, sometimes we, I find that we just mouth it, but we doesn't come from the heart, you know. It, it's just we mouth it. It's something that we have learned over the years in the church to just say the words, you know. And so let's explore false worship. Let's go there. Let's, um, I thought of a movie set. I thought of actors and they logging on for a big movie that they're about to shoot. So these guys, they set up a false front. It's not a true front. It's not a true building. It's right there. It's a facade, what you call it. You, um, and they put on all their, uh, their outfits. If it's a cowboy movie, their cowboy outfits. Mm -hmm. And then um, by three months after they've done the movie, out goes everything. The whole movie set is packed up. Those buildings come down. It's an empty parking lot. It's an empty field. Sometimes when we go to church, it's very much like that. We come, our emotions get excited, the rhythm gets us going. Um, but we go home and we go back to our lives and we return to a life that doesn't change. These actors go back to their normal lives, they carry on and the movie's over the moment you go back home, there's no change. You've been emotionally whipped up. You've been entertained. There's been lights. There's been uh, uh, that steam. The smoke. The yeah. smoke. The poor worship leaders. We've had times <laughs> where we've started coughing. And you do this great praise and worship set, but the people go home and they're just the same. That is false worship. We were saying yesterday that you can't worship God beyond your knowledge of who He is. Yeah. If you don't know the one that you're worshiping, you cannot display true worship. Mm -hmm. If God is religion to you, you're not going to display freedom. So us as worshipers really need to get an incredible revelation yeah. of the beautiful love of Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know, false worship is worshiping what you see, isn't it, Rachie? Yeah. Take it yeah. over. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, when we worship what we see, there's no faith involved. You know, we walk, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. So even in a worship, we want to worship God by faith and not by sight. So faith is not dependent on how we feel. Faith is not dependent on what we're going through. Faith is not dependent on what people think of us. Mm. Faith is not dependent on all of these external circumstances. Faith is not dependent on those things. And actually the faith that we have is a gift from God. It's the grace of God and the gift of God that gives us the faith. Now, kind of what, what is faith? It's that believing God and believing God is who he says he is. And in, in worship, um, there's, you know, we often hear the phrase, not in worship, but generally, fake it till you make it. Well, worship is not one of those places where you can fake it till you make it. God says that, you know, if you have, the Bible says if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. So you don't have to have a lot of faith, but you do have to move in the measure of the faith that you've been given. Now, somebody may be operating in faith and they're doing great and wonderful things according to their faith. But just because you're not at that point doesn't mean that you can't operate. So we mustn't compare each other and compare our giftings and compare where we're at. I don't know um, where, you know, I can't com compare myself with Charlene. I can't compare her faith journey with my own. 
we have our own faith journeys, we have our own revelations of who God is. And I can't base my revelation of who God is on Charlene's revelation. I have to have my own revelation. I have to have my own relationship with God. And so, so we say, you know, just to come to God and believe that he is, you know, and believe that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. Coming to God saying, God, I believe you are who you say you are. And I believe that if I come before you, as I seek you, you will reward me for seeking you. Lord, I trust you. And in that measure of faith, as we even as worshippers, we can just really come to God freely and allow him to do great things. And as we move in that faith, we experience more things with God. God does things for us where we know, God, I can trust you. And I think our relationship and this faith is about this moving on with God and moving on in trust. We build relationships on trust. My relationship with Charlene, it has grown and it has, we've had to build it on trust. Mm. It doesn't happen in day one. I can't meet somebody in day, on day one and, and we have this, um, you know, you can have a good relationship to start with, but as the years go by and as time goes by and as you spend time on the relationship, as you build, the trust grows. I know you begin to know who this person is, what they're about. And this is how it is with God. We think that we can come to church and just get up on the stage and sing some songs because we've got a nice voice or because we can play an instrument. But God isn't interested in our nice voice, as beautiful as it may be. And he's not really interested in our beautiful playing, as wonderful as that is. God is interested in our hearts and he wants us to come to him in faith knowing that when we come to him, he will reward those who seek him. Amen. So what are we seeking him for? Yeah. When we come to worship, like, why do we worship? Yeah. What, what, are we, what are we seeking him for? When we come into worship, we want God's presence to come. We don't want it to be the presence of Rachel, the presence of Charlene, yeah. the presence of Vinesong. They're worthless. We want to have the manifest presence of God because in the presence of God, we are changed and people are changed. Hey, yes, Shani. it's true. So we want to establish really what worship's all about because we think it's singing songs. And we think many times that we are, <laughs> Rachel and I like to say we worship worship because we try and uh, find the nicest songs, the trendiest songs, the coolest songs that are going on now. But in the end, um, I wonder if we ever really pray and say, Holy Spirit, what songs please you? Because it might be songs that might be trendy and cool, but it could be these evergreen songs that we might have just sang this afternoon that are oldies, golden oldies, but they are evergreen. And they bring the presence of the Lord. And we, in these last days, really have to seek after the anointing. More than anything, seek after the anointing. And how do you seek after the anointing? Is to seek the Holy Spirit. True worship is a lifestyle. And if you walk by faith and not by sight, can we say we worship by faith and not by sight? My husband Dan said, if you look at, uh, uh, if you're in a situation where a worship leader is busy worshiping, you can easily see what worship they are doing because people will either be looking at them on the stage or they will be looking up and worshiping away from him. And if you're a person that can guide people away from you and guide them to Jesus, that is the ultimate worship. Mm. Many times when, uh, when you go on holiday, and let's take uh, Paris, for example, yeah. and we go to the Eiffel Tower, and we, we, we stand in front of this huge Eiffel Tower behind us, and we take a selfie, and we put it all over social media. And, you know, it's not about you, the selfie, is it? It's about the Eiffel Tower. So when you're worshipping, you want to keep on pointing them to Jesus. If you are born of royalty, 
you know who you are and you can just relax. I'm looking at the, uh, uh, you know, all the procession of, of, uh, of the funeral today and they look so in their roles whenever you see the royal family, they know who they are. When they come into a room, everybody is in awe, you know, and they, they know the order they're, they're going to sit. They, there's yes. even order in the, how they sit. There's significance in the order in which they sit there and the go. order in which yes. they do things. Yeah. yeah, yeah, continue. Yeah, and if you catch a glimpse of who you are in Christ, you don't have to try and worship. It comes naturally <laughs> when God and man are together at the same time. That's when true worship is, when your supernatural becomes natural. When you've been in a, a church service where the worship leader has totally surrendered to God and you feel safe in, in him knowing that he is not there for entertainment or his own fame, you feel you've been washed, you feel you've been cleansed, and you leave going home changed. You're not like the guys who went to... Uh, uh, um, uh, record the movie yes. and they go back to the old life now we're back to true worship where the worship is so strong the mighty presence of the Holy Spirit flowed so wonderfully people were healed people were changed divorces were no more um, families came together young people changed they, they, they throw away their video games they come home they are totally changed for the Lord that is where the Holy Spirit wants to lead the church to every Sunday there is such a move of the Holy Spirit because there on there's not a focus on the songs there's a focus on him and him alone when you step out of the boat you don't look at what's going on around you you look at Jesus he is the author and the finisher of our faith we worship by faith and not by sight, not by what we see other worshippers do. He made you unique. And you know, worship is only an extension of your closet. When you're in your closet, when you're worshipping and you're on the stage, it's like your closet is opening. And whatever happened in the closet is happening on the stage. Mm. As worshippers, we need to come back to the closet. We need to come back to our time that's precious with the Holy Spirit. Many times when I've picked up my phone and, oh, I got a text and I must do that, I feel the Holy Spirit saying, put it down. Put it down, please. Hey, knock, knock. Can I come in? Can I come and tell you? Everybody of us wants a prophetic word. Prophetic word. Give me a prophetic word. He has a prophetic word for you every <laughs> single day. Yeah. Do you know that? And when you come into your closet and when you wait on him and tell you it's an art, mm. it's tough to wait on him, to whoo, just be quiet and your mind is going, where your children, what are you supposed to be doing? You have to come past that prayer barrier. You have to push through. You know, Matthew says, um, those who endure shall be saved. But in Isaiah 30 verse 15, it says, in returning to me and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence is your strength. And I think in these last days, he really wants to have a strong church, a mighty church. But it's only in the quiet and returning to him and in confidence that he will speak, that it will be your strength. We need to be as worshippers, as the remnant, as the ones that are chosen for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. Out of all the people, all the generations from Adam till now, that's a lot of people. He's chosen us, you and us, to see the coming of Jesus. Isn't that incredible? Amen. What a responsibility. I can't borrow a relationship with God. No. I can't get a relationship with God from 
the church that I go to. I can't get a relationship with God from the pastor, from whoever is my pastor or leader. They may be mighty, mighty men and women of God. And, you know, belonging to a great church is, does not guarantee me a relationship with God. I can't have a relationship with God by proxy. I can't have a relationship with God through someone else. And I think this was the, when we see the 10 virgins, the five wise, they had a relationship with God. And you know, when we have, it's not about I know God, it's about He knows me. Hey, hallelujah. Does God know you? Do you spend time in His presence? And I'm not trying to tell you, you know, sometimes you can get so guilty. People yeah. tell you you need to be spending two and three hours and, and, you know, waiting on the Lord and fasting and praying. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. God walked with Adam in the cool of the day and God longs to have that relationship oh, yes. with you. I was, I was actually reflecting and thinking about and everybody's different. Everybody has a different way of communicating with God. Everybody has a different way of communicating with other individuals. My relationship with Charlene is going to be different than, to somebody else's relationship with Charlene because we are different people. But our relationship with God is he wants to walk with us in the cool of the day. And I was just reflecting on, well, how do I really worship? Because often I don't use music at all. Mm. I don't actually use music. Um, sometimes I do, but most of the time I do not. Why? Because I want to hear what God is saying. And I also want to hear what my heart is saying. When there's noise... When there's distraction, I don't even know what I'm thinking, let alone to present it before the King of Kings. And so it's time. There are times when we just need to come before the Lord and be quiet. We don't need music. Mm -mm. We don't need distraction. We don't need to put on YouTube and put on the next anointed person. Yes, that can help us get into the presence of God. But when we're there, we need to be able to rest. And I think that scripture that Charlene read about Isaiah, th that Isaiah 30, 15, being able to take that time and rest. And those five wise virgins. I mean, if you read, we're not going to read the scripture, but we want you to um, write it down. Matthew 25. They knew God. They had a relationship with God. They were waiting there and they had extra oil. They weren't fretting about what they're going to do or where they're going to go or what's the next church service. They had a relationship with God that was deep. I was thinking about this, you know, so why the five foolish virgins, how come they didn't, why is it that they didn't have enough oil? Yeah. You know, why is it that they were not able to just wait around for the bridegroom coming? Why was their light going out? Your light is not sustained by attending church services. Church is good yeah, and going to church is good, but that is not going to sustain you. It's, uh, you're real, you go to church and you fellowship with other people because you first fellowship with God. That is the most important thing. Having fellowship with God enables you and enriches the fellowship that you have with others. Now, the five foolish virgins, if you read that scripture, when the, the bridegroom came while they were out looking for oil, they were out looking for oil. They came back and they were knocking on the door. Please let us in. Please let us in. And you know what the bridegroom said? Depart from me. I, I know, do know you, you not. I do not know you. So we, we think the issue is, oh, the oil. They did, the, the issue was that they didn't have their own relationship with God. The work of God in their life was not producing the oil. I don't think that the um, ten, the five wise virgins had to go and buy oil. Their lives with God and their relationship with God was producing, continually producing that oil. So they had an unlimited supply. But because the five foolish virgins were not linked in with him, they were of the church. They were kind of around Christians. They were Christians. They believed, but they didn't have relationship. And in order to, to worship, we need to have relationship with God. At times it's difficult 
at times we really are in a tough spot. But even in our hard times, even when we feel like we don't have words to say, you know, the Bible says that even the Spirit intercedes for us with groans and utterances that we can't understand. We ourselves can come before God and say, you know, God, I don't know. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what's going on, but I need you. Mm. I remember at times in my life that all I cried out was God. Help me. That was my prayer. <laughs> that was my prayer. There was no long one hour, two hours. It was God, help me. I need you. And he answered. He wants to answer those persistent prayers. But these things, this relationship is fundamental to worship. If I don't know who God is, yes. then I can't worship him because I don't place any value or enough value on him. And the more I get to know God, the more value I place on him. It's a relationship that we grow in. So our worship should grow, get deeper and be more enriched as time goes by. When someone comes to a uh, store, Mm -hmm. and they want to buy a big diamond. They have to put a massive amount of money down and pay for that big diamond. And when God the Father mm. saw you and me, guess what was our price? His only son. He had to put his only son down on the counter in order to get you. That is how valuable you are. And, you know, religion says you have to love God. Relationship says, no, no, I love you. And all you need to do is respond to my love. Receive. And if you know how much God loves you, and it's so easy because we tell everybody Jesus loves you, but do you really, really know he is so enthralled with you. He sings over you with gladness. He dances over you. He, uh, he watches over you. He doesn't slumber or sleep. He loves you. He paid Jesus in order to grab you back because he loves you so much. And it's so easy just to say, I don't know how to love you. I don't know how to worship this God. You're, you're too infinite. You're too amazing. I, I don't see you. Show me who you are. And that is the place where you have in your closet. Yeah. When you come to quiet, quiet place and you allow the Holy Spirit to show you who he is. And we want to just allow you to know the person of the Holy Spirit. You know, another name for the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Truth. Amen. And we are talking about true, true worship. worship. In these end times, the worship is about the Holy Spirit. Every time we minister, we cry out for the anointing. And we reach into a place that we grab from, from our closet, you know, because sometimes the moment you leave your closet, life is so busy. Oof. Children, work, finances, marriage. I was even thinking about my marriage with Daniel. Many times when you're so busy, you grow apart. Do you know the only way that I can feel like I get closer to my husband is when I allow myself to go back to the beginning, to think of the good things to think of beautiful things that he has done, how he captured my heart in the beginning. And I, rem the Holy Spirit has taught me to think of the good things that he did, how, who I fell in love with in the beginning. And you know what? All over again, those romantic love just keeps pouring out of me. So when you... Think about Jesus when you allow yourself to write down the things that he means to you. Then you can just worship out of a place of fullness. 
You don't have to try. You just worship him because he's so wonderful to you. But I think while we were discussing this, I think you and Dan were discussing and Dan said that the biggest worshippers, we always think the biggest worshippers are the people upon the stage, the people with the pulpit ministry yeah. Yeah. and the people that can be seen. Yeah. yeah. But the biggest worshippers are the people, often the people who don't sing or can't sing. What are they doing? They're serving. They're cleaning the toilets. They're cooking the food. Sometimes they're the ones that are out of the service doing the ushering. Yeah. Yeah. They're doing, uh, you know, they're doing the children's church, which is in a, in a room uh, down the way that you can't see. Nobody sees, nobody sees them. But they're serving, always serving, always sacrificing, even when they come together for corporate worship and everybody else is getting there and having their t worship time. They're serving, they're giving, they're giving of themselves so that, that everybody else Everybody else can have that great corporate worship experience. And it's just, it's a very selfless act, putting others and esteeming others above yourself. And so we often want to look at people that we can see and think, oh, these people are great worshipers. But it's often the quiet people in the background who see the things that you don't see and get the things done. Something breaks and it's fixed. You didn't even know it was broken. Why? Because somebody, they've got that servant heart in the house of God. We were talking about um, uh, David being a man after God's own heart. And we hear a lot about that. We hear about David being a man after God's own heart. And when we look at David's life, wow, boy, if we did half of the things that he did, maybe some of us have, maybe some of us haven't. Um, you know, you think, wow, how, how could he have done all those things? And, and yet he's still a man after God's own heart. And what I saw as I was reading the scripture was that David was always a man. He held nothing back from God. So he gave God the good. He gave God the bad and he gave God the ugly. He didn't try to hide his sin and put a fig leaf like Adam. He knew he was a sinful man, but he, and he never hid anything from God and God could trust him. When the woman at the well encountered God's love and mercy through Jesus Christ, she could not be the same. When nothing could be hid anymore, when he, he told her everything about herself that, um, that was true, she no longer felt shame, but she had a desire to live differently. She didn't want to go back to her old life. A trip to the well in the middle of the day, because the other women didn't want to be seen with her, bought freedom and bought change. And this is what God wants to do with us. Yeah. When we encounter God's love, mercy and compassion, we can never be the same. And we, nobody has, will have to tell us how to worship. When we experience God's mercy and compassion in areas of our lives that we've exposed to him and we've said, God, here I am, this is me, mm. and I'm not holding anything back from you. Do with me whatever you will. Deal with whatever trauma, deal with whatever pain, deal with the things that I don't want to let go of. I lay everything bare before you and I say, Lord, this is yours, have your way. When we, when we do that and God moves on our behalf and moves in our situation and brings hope and healing, we can never go back to how we were. We can never be the same and we will worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. When Jesus told this lady about who she was, she started asking about, well, you know, the Jews used to talk about worshipping in Jerusalem. And we say you've got a Mount worship here um, in Samaria at Mount Gerizim. So, you know, where should, where should I worship? And Jesus said, there's a time coming. Hmm. And that time is now here. Amen. When those who worship will worship in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? Worship is not linked to a location. Worship is uh, when we worship in the spirit, the spirit is not limited by location. Hmm. 
we can worship the Lord anywhere. We can worship the Lord when we're going to work in the car. We can worship the Lord when we're going for a walk. We can worship the Lord when we're in the the supermarket. We can worship the Lord when we're with our children at the park. Mm. We can worship the Lord in all of that. We can give him thanks from our hearts saying, God, I love you and I appreciate you. And I thank you for the value and everything that you've done for me. Praise the Lord. What a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Why don't we just pray right now and just ask the Holy Spirit uh, to come and do a brand new thing in our lives. He's about to do something new, not something old, something fresh, a new revelation. He wants to touch you and change your life. In Luke, it says, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, He will give you the Holy Spirit. So let's close our eyes right now. We say, Holy Spirit, we have been in your presence. We have listened to the words you have given us to share. We ask that it will bear bountiful fruit. Lord, that in these end times, as we enter into a phase of getting the bride ready for her bridegroom, that you will cleanse us of all unforgiveness, all hatred, all confusion. We tell the spirit of religion to flee in the name of Jesus. And we ask for revelation knowledge of Christ in us, the hope of glory. We thank you, Father, that as we pursue you, pursue your heart, come back to our closets and our hiding places where we will seek you and experience the reward of hearing your voice. We want to know this God that we worship. We want to know more of you, Holy Spirit, our comforter and our truth, the one who guides us and leads us. Come, Holy Spirit, come and ignite the fires again and show us your love for us in ourselves We can do nothing, but with you, we can do everything. We can even be worshippers. Praise your name. We give you glory. Amen.